Huge welcome on the show now to the author of a fantastic history of the European Championship, the UEFA European Championship, call it the European Nations <laughs> Cup, call it Euro 2020. Its name's got shorter as, as the tournament's got bigger, but a big welcome now to Jonathan O'Brien. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for having me on. No, great, to, great to talk to you. You're, you're um, a historian, a writer with When Saturday Comes. I think you've done some work with the uh, the Irish Independent, I see, in the Sunday Tribune. So um, fantastic to to have you on here. Um, the European Championship, I always think of them as the European Championships. I know that we're supposed to shorten to Euro this and Euro that now, but I can never get that. That's the title I think I grew up with. But it's just dawned on me, Jonathan, that the, the, the tournament, the European Championship, is as old as I am, and it seems to have had the similar kind of... Um, <laughs> story of its life. It got bigger over the years. You know, it started out as a small four-team tournament. Now it's a twenty-four yeah. um, monolith. You know, it's a great-looking book. I mean, what what made you um, what made you choose it as a subject to 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 write about? Well, um, I, I started on it about uh, seven Christmases ago. I think. Um, okay. I was um, I was sitting up on um, St Stephen's Day, or as you guys call it, uh, Boxing Day. Uh, the wife had gone to bed. I was watching some old Euro stuff on DVD, and it just came to me like, has anyone done a, a book about this? Because, um, like, we can all think of plenty of really good World Cup books from people like Brian Glanville yeah. and Hugh yeah. McIlvanny and what have you. But I couldn't think of one that I'd seen anyway over the years. So the next day I went digging, and I found a couple of German ones and one French one. Uh, right. But nothing, nothing in English, nothing substantial anyway. Um, and I thought, my God, like, I mean, Someone should maybe there's a gap in the market here. I can I can if I set a bit of time aside. So I I, I started off on it and uh, I realised after a while that it, it could work as a, as a book. Uh, it took a good long while to to get it into print though. Um, the the COVID nineteen pandemic coming along was actually I don't want to sound crass when I say this, but it was a blessing in disguise for me because I didn't get in contact with Pitch Publishing until July twenty twenty. I think right um, yeah. It was, it was a guy called Michael Gibbons, who's a fantastic football writer. He co-wrote the amazing book, uh, Danish Dynamite, about the Danish team of the 80s. And uh, I know him online for a, a good number of years. And uh, he put me in touch with them, and they were on for it. And it's went from there. And you're right, it is a beautiful-looking book. Um, the, the photographs are wonderful. And uh, the, the cover by Duncan Allner, I have to give a shout-out to him. He's he's an absolute uh, wizard with visuals. So, um yeah, I, I got in contact with them, but a little under 18 months ago, and we went from there. Um, the main, the body of the book was a lot longer than it is. And it's, it's a fairly hefty book anyway, but my initial uh, word count was insane. It was about 360,000 words. So they said, <laughs> oh, wow. They said, okay, yeah. yeah. They said, okay, yeah, we, we won't be having that. So I spent nearly as much time cutting it down. And I'm, I'm an editor in my day job. I work for the Business Post in Dublin, which is kind of like the Irish equivalent of the FT or the Wall Street yeah. Journal. Yeah. And part of my job is to chop other people's stuff and fact check and, and all the rest of it. And it really is a truism that when you've got a big wad of text in front of you and you need to cut, say, let's say 50,000 words, the first 45,000 words are no problem. The final 5,000, that's the killer. <laughs> I take my hat off. I take my hat off to anyone that can write that amount. I, I, after about the first page, I'm, I'm finding it painful to, to get well, much that's, further. That's, that's, that's the thing, though, Nick. Like at the time, I I didn't have a publishing deal with with Pitch. So when you've when you've nobody to shout stop, as it were, uh, <laughs> you, you just go on and on and on. It's a wonderful cover. Um, just to describe it for listeners, um, it's uh, Chiellini on the front. There, I see from that'll be from this uh, this year's. Um, it's Euros. actually Bonucci. Sorry to sorry Bonucci. to cross. Sorry, no, no, no. Correct me, correct me. I, I thought I thought I'd test my own knowledge, and I I, I couldn't. Uh, uh, it you it know, was check going them out. It was going to be Harry Kane, but uh, Gareth well, Southgate... that never worked out, idea. did it? That never worked yeah. out. <laughs> uh, Zinedine Zidane, I think I'm correct on that one. Ruth Vu yeah. Vula, and, and is that Ruth Ensor Schifo? It is uh, indeed. And to be honest, Schifo is mainly there for that jersey that he's wearing, the, the beautiful Argyle uh, red jersey yeah. that Belgium had at Euro 84. There we are. That, that... Just beautiful. Like I said, it followed the 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 uh, European Championships are strangely followed my own life, and now I'm losing the plot. So the the most recent player is the one that I got wrong. So uh, that, maybe <laughs> that, maybe that says something. I I don't know. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful stuff. I mean, it's it's a, a fantastic 
story of, of I mean, it reflects European history as much as as it does a football tournament, Jonathan, doesn't it? I mean, the you know, I, I was struck by the opening tournament in 1960 features, uh, I think it's three nations that no longer exist in in, in a strict sense: USSR, that's, Czechoslovakia, yeah. and Yugoslavia. That's right; they're all gone, as we know. And uh, yeah. for instance, like the Copa America has been around since about 1928 or something like that, I think. But uh, the Euros took a long, long time to get off the ground. Uh, most of the national federations after after World War Two, like everyone's rebuilding, everyone's in bits. And uh, a lot of the big European nations just showed little interest in entering anything that wasn't the World Cup. There was mm. a great example. Um, the Germans uh, sat out the first two tournaments, and that was because they had a, a manager who'd been there for like 100 years. He, he was the guy who was in charge when they won the World Cup in 54 yes. against Hungary. His name was uh, Sepp Herberger, and he just had a complete uh, hostility to this new thing. He, he, he didn't want to, he thought the fixture calendar was too crowded anyway. So the Germans, uh, as the Euros are coming into being, the Germans ignore it. They go off to the World Cup in Chile in 62 after only playing four competitive games in four years, I think. And uh, they got bumped up by Yugoslavia because they were so rusty. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, the first winners of the of the, of the uh, European Nations Cup or Championship, whatever way you want to call it, has had many names with the USSR beating Czechoslovakia 2-1. In, in the final, which was played in France. Refereed by Arthur Ellis, uh, Jonathan. Now, I, 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 I'm stuck with Arthur Ellis as a referee on It's a Knockout in my head, but it's hard. <laughs> it's, <laughs> he was a proper referee and he took on, I, I never realised he took on the European final. Well, yeah, now to be quite honest, I don't remember much about him uh, while, while writing the book because I wrote that section back in 2015 or 2016 <laughs> probably. But I do remember, I think, I think he was in charge for the Battle of Bern in 1954 in the yeah. World Cup between Hungary and Brazil, where they were literally bottling each other in the tunnel afterwards. So uh, <laughs> I, I think he sent off three people, in that, but apparently he was superb on the day. And he, uh, a, a worse referee would have sent off half the teams, I think. Yeah, he he, he did a lot of big internationals back then. Uh, th there were fewer referees around at the time that could be trusted with such so, sort of showpiece occasions. So in the early years of the tournament, you see the same names as referees coming up again and again. Right. Concetto Lobello of Italy, uh, Ortiz de Mendesibel of, of Spain and people like that, and Leo van Horn of, of the Netherlands. And Arthur Ellis would be one of those guys too. I found a fantastic um, uh, TV review of the first final, which was actually in, um, it's a Northern Irish paper, actually. It's the Belfast Telegraph and it's their TV commentator writing about last night's television referring to the BBC scoring heavily with live Sunday soccer, which was the final between Russia and, and Yugoslavia, and I just love the, um, the the opening line, which seems quite quaint in the light of um, the, the modern football scene, but he says, I never thought the time would come when a midsummer Sunday evening would find me sitting through the heat of an international association football match. Um, but there I was watching the, B with the BBC audience counted in the millions entranced by the skill of Russia and Yugoslavia. Um, I thought that's, that's a great, the idea yeah, of live well football. Yeah, yeah. It's a good um, line, and there, there was there was some interest around Europe as well. Like for instance, the Soviet Union, all their qualifiers were huge attendances at the big old um, Lenin Stadium in in Moscow, and yeah. uh, there was a line that I got in about how uh, the one of the Soviet players he said afterwards, uh, we were we were told that back in Moscow there wasn't one single uh, window in darkness in the whole city. Everyone was up because it was about one in the morning when the match finished, and you could obviously you couldn't really party on the streets in Moscow in 1960 for obvious reasons. <laughs> But uh, uh, he, he, said, he said that the level of interest was huge from the word go, even then. So that game was played in the Parc des Princes in, in, in Paris, 2-1 win for the Soviet Union. And, you know, so it would go on. I mean, there, there's been fraught with political problems, I suppose, as we've said already, Jonathan. I mean, really reflecting the European story over over the 60-odd the years since. And, you know, you've got issues of uh, Spain playing the Soviet Union. And I think there was, I found a report saying they offered to play that game in a neutral country because it was due to be played in... It was played in Madrid, wasn't it? The final of 64. The 64 final, they eventually did meet. But they got each other in the quarterfinals in 1960. And, and uh, they the day after Real Madrid hammered Eintracht Frankfurt in the European Cup final in Glasgow 7-3, the day after yeah. that match... Um, the three lads who co-managed Spain at the time, the selection committee, uh, they were in Moscow the day after that match to watch the USSR uh, play. Some, I can't even remember which team. It was maybe Finland, the USSR okay. were playing. And yeah. they beat them 7-1, I think. No, I think it was Poland, actually, uh, now that I think of it. 7-1, and they thought, 
we don't really want to be playing these guys. And then Franco got wind of it. And the whole idea of uh, like the Soviet flag flying at the Bernabeu and the Soviet anthem ringing out, that was complete anathema. Was an anathema, him. yes, that's right. That's the yeah. same words, yeah. So, so they, they, were all, they were all brought, uh, the, the, the squad all assembled in Madrid and they were told, no, we're not playing them, sorry, that's it. And they were all livid. They really wanted to play. They wanted to test themselves against these uh, Soviets. Franco just... Didn't fit his... Real, um... real behaviour, obviously. The real reason was the USSR were a very good team and Franco was terrified that they would lose, Spain would lose. It's, it's, it's fascinating these 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 political undertones to you know what is, should be a football term, but of course it's always loaded with other stuff you know heaped on top of it, isn't it? I mean, Spain are actually three times winners of the tournament, sixty four with the tournament we're talking about, um, alongside um, two thousand eight, two thousand and twelve, and runners up in eighty four. I'd forgotten, I'd forgotten that. Yeah, um, the the eighty four team is 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 a bit of a an, an anomaly uh, in their history because. Uh, obviously, for for decades before the Tiki Taka years, the, Spain were mm. renowned for playing nice football, but falling short usually, like in the quarterfinals or the second yeah. round. But well, the '84 team were very, very dirty, and Spanish football in general was very dirty at the time. Um, Terry Venables gets some credit uh, if you talk to people in Spain about sort of slowly changing the culture of Spanish football because he he was obviously at Barcelona, and Barcelona were renowned as the dirtiest of the lot before he came. Uh, <laughs> okay. Spurs, fans, Spurs fans of a certain age will remember Barcelona kicking lumps out of Spurs in the Cup Winners Cup in '82, uh, and the '84 team that nearly bet France in the final. Uh, the, uh, some some of the fouls they committed were just absolutely eye watering. Not so much in the final, but especially in the semi final against uh, against Denmark. There was one foul by Victor on right. a little a little Danish midfielder called Jens Jorn Bertelsen, and. I actually, I actually yelped when I saw it first on on DVD a few years back. It's an astonishing challenge, and of course George Courtney didn't even book him. <laughs> it just was a complete, a completely different time, different uh, different era of football, Jonathan. You yeah, know, absolutely. Yeah, you could do you could do nearly anything to anyone back then. Yeah, I think you know it's, it was just it was just played differently back then, rightly or wrongly, and you can take take your views on that, listeners, but. The first tournament that I really remember, I mean, I, I'm speaking from a very personal point of view because I find that with major football tournaments, it's it's it, it kind of your life is often lived around the rhythm of World Cups or, in this case, European Championships. But I well remember the 1972 tournament, in particular England's defeat at home uh, at Wembley to, to West Germany. Just back to the political side of things again. There's still West Germany at this time. Um, and I remember it well because it was the first major match that I ever watched that was in colour television. Until then, I'd only ever experienced football as a black and white um, TV experience. And we, my dad had just got us a colour television for this big game. And I can well remember the green of the German shirts and the, the brilliance of the team that night. I mean, it, Gunter Netzer, I remember particularly as a master midfielder, um, taking a game to England at home, which still felt, even then, Jonathan, it might sound strange, but even then still felt like... Um, England never really lost at Wembley, and yet you know that was that was the start of the seventies when when really uh, you couldn't say that so much anymore. Yeah, it was it was it was it was it was it was a big big event in my life actually that three one win because um, it, it you know I suppose on, I hadn't seen much of the Mexican World Cup because it was I was young and also it was played at hours often too late for me to sit up and watch. But I will remember this: it was it was a Saturday night um, major kind of landmark event, and West Germany would obviously. Press on and win that that um, tournament in in um, in I think it was the, the final was played in Germany if memory serves. No, actually it was in it was in Belgium. Uh, but I do Belgium. remember I, I I I sat down and watched that England West Germany game on DVD. Must be mm. 10, 15 years ago before I was even thinking of the book, and um, it was incredibly atmospheric. There was uh, Wembley was packed, so that was nearly a hundred thousand people there. It was raining, uh, and as you say, the Germans in the green shirts, and yeah. and the thing about that game is England. England never gave up and they stuck at it, but the Germans were just one level above them, really, and they couldn't really do anything about that. Um, 1972, I think, was the moment that was the year where the Euros really uh, stepped up a gear and became a proper showpiece of it. The first three tournaments, to varying degrees, they were mediocre, and 1968 was particularly awful, a really bad tournament. I think if, if they'd had another bad one in 72, who knows? The event may never have fully recovered, but yeah. in the event it was it was superb, uh, and I, I do think pound for pound that German team 
are probably the best ever to win it. Taking into account all the differences between modern footballers and footballers back then with regards to diet and fitness and blah, blah. Taking all that into account, I still think uh, the West Germans of 72 uh, have to have to be considered the best. Uh, they just... They had they had no apparent weakness anywhere. Uh, like you, like even the, even the Spain teams of of uh, uh, more recent Sergio Ramos, for instance, would always have a mistake in him somewhere or wherever. But yeah. West Germany, like they had they had incredible players who were just completely in the supporting cast and happy to play second field, like um, Herbert Wimmer and uh, Erwin Kramers, people like that who. Your average football fan wouldn't have heard of these days, but but take it from me, they were world class. Yeah, I mean that was the uh, that German side, as as you say rightly, it was played in in the Heisel Stadium in Brussels, the final three 0 win over the Soviet Union. But that West German team would press on two years later to win it at home, uh, the World Cup at home in in, in uh, Germany. So um, a great great side. Even now, I can remember uh, Gerd Müller spinning, as it seemed to me as a kid, on the edge of the penalty area and slotting home from. The edge of the penalty area. It was it was one of those moments that uh, stick in your head. It football's got this ability to make you fall in love with moments, and that that was one of those moments. Exactly, despite, yeah. that's it. That's exactly. Despite uh, the Germans, losing, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the the Germans were a great team, and as you say, they proved it um, two years later when they they beat the Dutch in the final. And if you watch that Dutch final again, like there's no doubt about it, the Germans were well worth their win on the day. It wasn't some kind of hard luck story. And then, of course, two years after that, uh, they the West Germans nearly win three in a row only for Anthony and Panenka and about a million amazing saves by Ivo Victor in the 76 final in Belgrade. Uh, yeah. but, but for that, they would have had three trophies in a row. I'm not, I'm not sure even... Well, Spain, Spain managed it, actually, uh, but nobody else ever has. I mean, that 76 tournament, Jonathan, I mean, that, that, that kind of demonstrates one of the other points that I picked out just looking through um, you know the, the the tournaments. I mean, it's it's capacity to have a giant killing winner. Um, the World Cup has never really matched it in that way, has it? But you've got Czechoslovakia winning there in '76. Uh, you'd say yeah. against the odds in, in in footballing power terms, but it's happened since in in 2004 with Greece and I suppose Denmark in '92. A similar kind um, of um, yeah, and and Portugal in 2016. Even I yeah, know they had run, yeah. but but. In terms, like nobody was was touting them to win it beforehand. Um, I think there's there's this weird thing whereby the standard of the Euros overall, I think, is has been higher historically than the World Cup because you do get six or seven, maybe maybe not six or seven, maybe three or four really poor teams in a World Cup generally. Uh, yeah. You don't really get that in in the Euros that you've you've had the occasional team that just gets whitewashed, like my own uh, countrymen in. 2012, God help, <laughs> uh, or Denmark in, in 2000, or you could have yeah. it but it doesn't happen too often. Yeah. And um, like even most recently, everyone expected North Macedonia to get a couple of hidings off the Dutch and Austria, maybe, and it didn't happen. They were competitive in every match. Uh, so maybe, possibly that's why it, the Euros tend to throw up the odd shock winner. Uh, there's less of a gap between the very bottom and the very top. And it's at the end of the day, it's a, it's a cup run, it's a cup competition, so these things can happen now and again. I mean, that seventy six was. I, I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm if I'm if I'm not. But that was one of the first, if not the first, major final to be settled in a penalty shootout. It's become more commonplace since. Isn't it? Yeah, I think it was the first ever. Um, and uh, as usual, uh, none of, none of the Germans wanted to take one. I en- I ended up uh, <laughs> unearthing a German yearbook from back then. I found it on eBay. And I got yeah. someone to translate it, and I had an entire list of uh, quotes from players during the penalty shootout. And uh, I think even Sepp Meyer was volunteering to take one at one stage because nobody else wanted to. And then, of course, Uli Hoeneß comes up for his kick and nearly, uh, nearly kicks it into into Bosnia uh, from, where, <laughs> from where it was. It must be a nerve wracking uh, experience. I wouldn't want to do it. Yeah, personally. seventy-six was wonderful. I think there was nineteen goals in four games, and even even the third place playoff was was brilliant as well. Uh, I have them all on DVD somewhere, and they're they're a pleasure to watch. The, the game was just a little bit more open back then, and yes, it was a little bit slower, but it, it was it was prettier, I think, in general. The players were able to express themselves a little more in a way that they can't really now because your opponent will be on top of you in two seconds if you if you don't get the ball away quickly. I mean, the, mod, the modern game is is driven by the needs of television, and that seventy six tournament was the last of the old fourteen tournaments, if you if I can put it that way. Um, yeah. After that, it began to expand, and it hasn't really stopped expanding ever since the eight, 1980 
Italian tournament was was eight teams, and it would remain so for the the duration of the eighties. I mean the as it's as it's got big. I mean, do you subscribe to the theory that as as things get bigger, they seem to lose their um, what's the word I'm searching for? Their, their quality, Jonathan. Am I, is that is that just well, like yeah, romance yeah. of an old man looking backwards? You know. Well, when when it went to 24 teams, I thought, oh Christ, here we go. And 2016, <laughs> 2016 was largely terrible. I thought it was a very poor tournament. But then 2021 was excellent, and. And that had the same number of teams. Yeah. So it, it, the, the sample size that we're talking about is really too small to draw any conclusions. In general, I do think endlessly expanding them is bad. Uh, like, I mean, if you look at Euro 84, uh, a super tournament, only eight teams. There, there were teams like the USSR missed out, Italy, yeah. Netherlands, yeah. England, uh, all decent teams. Uh, Italy were World Cup holders at the time. Like, so th- that was the absolute cream of the crop you were getting. Uh and you can't really have that with 24 teams. Like when it was at 16 teams, I wasn't sure, are there 16 good teams in Europe? Well, there certainly aren't 24 good teams in Europe, that's for sure. <laughs> However, uh, the what we saw in the summer was a revelation for the most part. It was really good. And I, I do wonder if subconsciously the players wanted to put on some kind of a, a spectacle after after the dreadful COVID year, year we had. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's just me floating a theory, but... You do wonder because it was so so good. It was really good. I, I, it's an, I put it's it an in interesting top. point. Yeah, it's an interesting point actually. I hadn't thought of it that way. I mean, the the, the eighty eight um, Netherlands to Soviet Union nil um, played in Munich. Well, that's that was the classic, possibly one of the greatest goals of all time. I'd say the oh, um, that was dope, yeah. the Van Basten volley. Um, how that how he did that is. Oh, who knows? I don't know if he, if he could explain. It was, it was it. a real, it was a real tragedy what happened to Van Basten. Uh, I have, I have his book here actually. It's, it's right by my side, and literally about half of the book is about him recovering from injury. It's a good read, and I would recommend it to people. But it is very bleak in places because the, the man was just in such so much pain for years on end, and at one point it looked like he was not going to be able to walk again. Right. Um, he he was only 23 when he scored that goal against the USSR, but he seemed much older. He seemed like about 28, 29. Um, he, him, along with Gerd Muller, I would say, are probably the two best strikers I've ever seen. And he, it, it's interesting to think now that he started 88 on the bench because the Netherlands had a very good fork, not in Van Basten's class, but a very good fork called Johnny Bosman, mm. who'd been scoring like a like a madman uh, yeah. for uh, for both the national team and for Anderlecht, I think it was, and before that Ajax. And Bosman was Renus Mikkel's man going into the tournament. So Van Basten was trying to um, force his way into the team. He was doing things like playing terrible passes to Bosman in training, trying to make him look bad. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's, that's the Dutch for you, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and, and so they lost their first game to the Soviets in Cologne. And Van Basten got on as a sub but couldn't do anything. So Mikkels took a gamble for the England game and threw Van Basten in and said, here's your chance, go for it. Right. And uh, in that game, he had four chances and he put three of them away and the other one was kicked off the line by Gary Stevens after he'd gone around Shilton. So he, he was he was just uncontainable uh, that day. England England played pretty well in that match. Um, but it's, all it's ever remembered as is a crushing defeat for them. And it was, it was rough on them because they didn't play that bad at all. They should have been... They should have scored twice when it was nil-nil. Lineker hit the post and Hoddle put a free kick against the post. It was just one of those days for them. You're not helping, Jonathan. You're not helping a painful memory here, mate. I'm bringing it all back, aren't I? <laughs> bringing it all back home. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, the 92 tournament is always fascinating because Denmark were not due to feature in it, were they? They, they replaced um, the former Yugoslavia, which had uh, That's right, disintegrated yeah. as, as, a, as a country. And yeah. they famously win yeah. it 2-0. Yeah, um, that's one of the maddest things I've ever seen in sport. Uh, in, in some ways, it was even more preposterous than the Greece thing in 2004. Yeah. Um, I, I was about 15 when it was on, and I was just glued to it. Um, the It's it's sometimes remembered as a dull tournament because the first two rounds of fixtures weren't that great. Um, but it, ex- it completely exploded at the end of the group stages, and then the two semis and the final were incredibly entertaining. And um, the story that Denmark were on the beach sunning themselves and then suddenly got the call to drop everything and run run to Sweden, it's not quite true. Um, they were they were playing. They had known for about two months this was going to be a possibility, and right. they played a couple of, they played a couple of friendlies and kept themselves fit. 
But some bits of it are true, like like that the manager Richard Miller Nielsen was putting in a new kitchen when he got the call. That's true. And the captain <laughs> Lars Olsen the captain Lars Olsen was on, on a ferry, on a car ferry, when he got the call. So they it's it's not true to say that they were they were just, you know, drinking their yeah, heads yeah. off two days before playing England in Malmo. Uh, but even without that, it's still an incredible story. And there's a very good feature film was made about it. The, the name of which escapes me, but it's it's easily searchable online. Uh, I watched it about two years ago. It's um, it's done with actors, but but uh, very unusually for a football film, the 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 match scenes are semi convincing. I wouldn't say fully convincing, but but much yeah, better exactly than accurate. Yeah, yeah, much better than what you see like in the Head and Shoulders ad with Antoine Griezmann or somebody <laughs> like that. But um. Yeah, it's it's very it's well worth catching, and it's 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 a great story, and it was it was, it was also very very funny as well. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 sport in a nutshell. The outsider comes in and wins a tournament and um, plays a, a brand of attacking football to do it, and long may that continue. Um, I mean, the, the nineteen ninety six English tournament is is one that obviously has acquired cultural kind of. Um, significance over here anyway um with the whole Gascoigne and uh, the German semi-final and, and all yeah. that comes with that but what, what I'm just looking at it as a as a kind of a, trying to be neutral my neutral hat on it's it's um the the Euros have always pushed the, the I don't know what is it pushed the boundaries I mean that was settled with a golden goal wasn't it the final of Germany That's versus right, Czech yeah. Republic um yeah you, all, all, Oliver Bierhoff scored it and they got rid of it after that um uh 96 I, I didn't think it was much of a tournament it had its moments but, but I, I certainly don't blame english people for going mad about it it was a really hot summer um they hadn't hosted a tournament in 30 years yeah uh brick pop was everywhere everyone knew the tories were going to get slung out in a year's time <laughs> well, of course, of it was course part of the type of party you know <laughs> absolutely people are gonna let that, and, and why shouldn't they um yeah. i thought england were very patchy in that tournament but they played two really good games obviously the, the dutch one that uh, one was the one that lives in the memory, yeah. But but even more so, the German performance. Uh, they were they were superb in that match, uh, and I think they should have won it. Um, they they gave it everything, but luck wasn't with them really. Uh, and there was this weird thing that Venables did. He didn't make a single substitution, even though certain players were out on their feet. It 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 appears he just forgot to make one, which is extraordinary. Which is, really, which is weird, but, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. If somebody had been thrown on, like Robbie Fowler or or whoever. Could have made the difference. We'll never know now, but that was no. that was, a, that was a, an extraordinary contest that night. The I mean, again, in the similar vein to the golden goal idea. I mean, the the split of Belgium and Netherlands in two thousand, and then later we'd see that in two thousand eight, Austria Switzerland. That it was actually become a, a more normal thing. But you know, a nation, multiple nations staging tournaments has become a thing. But that's the first time that I can remember. Um, Japan career was in uh, the World Cup was in 2002 that followed it yeah um, yeah Belgium and the Netherlands have always had this slightly odd relationship obviously Belgium is sort of two countries in one yeah uh, but 2000 was a, a super super tournament loads of great players rising to the occasion uh, th coaches throwing off the shackles and really going for it and it had so many twists and turns like I remember being furious at the time uh when uh, the, the Dutch lost to Italy on penalties, I was like, Italy have had about two shots in the whole game and they're going through. <laughs> and now, now I see that, like, player for player, they didn't really have what the Dutch had in terms of talent. So they were just doing what they had to do. Um, they got away with it, though. There, there was a lot of guff talk about, oh, it's a defensive match class. But they gave away two penalties. They gave away about another three or four good chances. And they had a fella sent off, uh, Zambrotta. Yeah. So while they, while they performed extremely well, it wasn't this impeccable shutout that people painted it as. Uh, and then, of course, they yeah they, they got a taste of their own medicine in the final. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because they actually, they, they looked much better in the final than in the semi. And they had their foot on France's throat. And then uh, Sylvain Wiltord popped up and Taldo let it slip through his hands and, and the rest is history. And if you watch that goal again, um, when, when the ball hits the net, the TV cameras cut to the Italian bench and they're all just, they've, they've all been standing on the sidelines waiting to run on them for the final whistle, you know? Yeah, and yeah. Well, so the goal goes in, camera cuts to them, and they all just literally fall back into their seats, except for Antonio Conte, who's leaning on the side of the dugout. And I can't really put into words his facial expression. He looks like he looks like his <laughs> house is burning down in front of him. <laughs> it's, well, it's well worth digging up on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was just the perfect ending to it, the whole thing.
I've nothing we, against him, but it was a great ending. No, we laugh. It's a personal tragedy for him, but we laugh anyway. There we are. <laughs> I mean, the, the Greek win in 2004 is another underdog. Um, I, from what I remember of that Greek side, I, they don't really stand in the memory other than the fact they did it. Um, they did seem to defend their way to the final there, uh, Jonathan. From, they did, from that's right. That and and in, in, the, in the knockout stages, all their goals were the same. It would be across from the right wing, never the left, always the right. Always the right. Um, two, I think it was two corners and one cross from open play. So, Three crosses from the right, three headers, and that was it. I think it was uh, Karisteas got two of them, and Delos got the other one against the Czechs. Um, th- again, they were they were just doing what they had to do. They they only had two semi-famous players going into that tournament. One was Nikos Dabizas of Newcastle, who was on the bench throughout because he had an injury, and the other was a guy called Gorgatos, who mm. played uh, as a winger, I think, for Inter Milan, and he fell out badly with Ray Hagel before the tournament and missed the whole thing. He wasn't picked, so. This, it, it, but, but from the moment you saw them in the opening match, you knew that they could do something because they, they went out and had a go against Portugal and they went 2-0 up. And I think Cristiano Ronaldo, a very young Cristiano Ronaldo, pulled one yeah. back with literally the last uh, touch of the game. I think it was a header. Um, so you could see they had a bit about them even then. They'd never even won a match in a tournament before that, I, I don't think. No. Um, they, they, they were no respect for reputations at all. Like I, I was delighted when they... I remember being delighted when they beat France in the quarterfinals because France were just so lazy that year uh just really bored and jaded looking team and complacent and smug and yeah the slightly up their asses <laughs> exactly <laughs> under jack santini later of spurs fame um, <laughs> and uh so that, things like that were great but I, I do remember being sickened when they beat the czech republic because the czechs were well superior to them and yeah. nedved did his knee after about a half hour and went off and the the, the occasion seemed to get to the czechs after that because he wasn't there um, I think I think 2004 would be remembered a bit more fondly if the final hadn't been so bad. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a dull game from memory, um, from what I can remember of it. It's one of those games that you kind of slightly erase from your memory banks as soon as the, the final whistle goes. Um, but yeah, I mean, another, another double-headed tournament, Austria-Switzerland uh, in 2008, and then Poland-Ukraine. Both Spanish wins. Um which and as as you said earlier on, Jonathan, it's slightly put to to rest the old Spanish reputation instead of this new model, um, you know, ticky tack attacking football style of, of Spanish Spanish football. So yeah, two strong wins there for the Spanish. In those two. Yeah, tournaments. If, you, if you if you look back at two thousand eight, they were a lot more direct than they would go on to be. They were coached by Luis Aragonés, um, mm. the Atlético Madrid uh, legend, in two thousand eight, and he. He had two very fast strikers. He had Torres and David Villa, and he liked using them with quick balls over the top. But by 2010, when Del Bosque was manager, uh, and obviously going into 2012 as well, by 2012, like Villa had broken his leg, so they rather than use a striker, a proper striker, they had this 4-6-0 formation, which was <laughs> so ungainly. And Cesc Fabregas was the furthest player forward. And that's yeah. that's not going to work. And they staggered through a few of their games. They they were very lucky to beat Croatia. They drew with Italy in the first match and should have lost. And they squeaked past uh, Portugal in the semi. But then, of course, they absolutely ran riot against Italy in the final. Uh, oh, no. yeah. They completely crushed them, which the Italians didn't deserve. It was just a, it was a tiredness issue, really, as much as anything else. I think Italy had to play the last half hour with 10 men because Thiago Motta uh, got injured and they they used up all their subs until Spain just scored a couple more uh, to rub it in at the end. But um, a, a super team, technically Spain, obviously, but a lot of the time not the most fun to watch. I don't think. No, and just to reinforce an earlier point that we made by this stage, it was a sixteen team tournament in uh, in twenty twelve, expanding to twenty four for the twenty sixteen tournament played in 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 uh, France. Um, uh, a Portuguese win on that occasion. That was a dull game, Jonathan. I, 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 I... It was, yeah. The, the only the only tension in it was trying to see how long Portugal could hang on after Ronaldo was kicked out of it by, I think it was Dimitri Payet in the first few minutes. Um, the the expansion in 2016 was very much Michel Platini's his baby. Like, he, he was the one who came up with it. He, he, he thought... Mm. Uh, he, he knew it was going to be in France, so he wanted it to be the biggest and best ever. And, of course, the irony was by the time it rolled around, he had been done for corruption and taken <laughs> home. So he was he was struck off the guest list. And then they, they changed their minds and they said, you can you can come to the games if you like. 
Uh, but he was, he was literally he was literally too depressed to come. And apparently, he didn't even watch very much of it on TV. I do feel a little sorry for him, but not that much. I've been to weddings like that, John. <laughs> <laughs> so we come to. <laughs> I, found, I, found, I found a great story about platinum actually. Just uh, sure. uh, while I was researching it, and um, supposedly the reason, the main reason that he took all that money under the counter uh, when he was uh, a sports administrator was because he found out about sort of ninety nine or two thousand that there was a French player at uh, Parma called uh, Alain Bogossian, reserve guy for the French national team, played played a couple right. of times in France ninety eight. And he found out that Bogosian was earning more in a month at Karma than Platini had been earning at Juventus in a year in the 80s. So he was understandably a little embittered by this fact that he missed out on the big gravy train and the all that. So, yeah. so he started uh, pocketing some of the scheming. money. He, he started into, scheming, basically. <laughs> scheming and skimming, both. <laughs> Oh dear, that's another that's another podcast. I think we'll, we'll save that for another time. The Platini story, um, oh, and then of course we will we'll skim over this this year's European wide um, twenty well, twenty twenty one twenty twenty whichever way you want to think of it. Which again, I think that was another Platini um, baby, wasn't it? The, the the idea of staging yeah. it as a kind of a pan yeah, European I mean, he, he was, yeah, he, he was just drunk on power by that stage, and he was coming up. With, God knows what he would have come up with for twenty twenty four, probably. <laughs> He might have three sets of goals on the pitch or something. He, as I say, he was he's long gone now at this stage. But uh, 2021, it was I think it was a tournament that transcended its own limitations. Like I mean, the new president of well, the current president of UEFA, uh, Alexander Cheferin, has come out and said, "Since we're not trying this again ever, uh, even if COVID nineteen hadn't happened, it still would have been unwieldy. It's bad for the planet with all the flights and and all that." And uh, I think he's right. I, I think. A tournament needs a central identity. It needs a sort of a certain feel, its own individual feel. And if your game's been played in Baku and Glasgow and uh, Copenhagen and uh, Seville, that's not going to happen. It's just going to feel like a, a collection it's of... Sprawling, um, Having said that, one of the best matches, international matches that I've seen in a while, That especially that particular day when um, Spain, Spain put five past Croatia, 5-3, and then in yeah. the evening, uh, the Swiss knocked out France. That was a, an enjoyable a day as I've had watching football in in years. Yeah, I mean, it has it has the capacity to deliver these great great moments. The uh, the European Championships for a, a tournament that's always, I don't know if it's been in the shadow of the of the World Cup. I think it probably has slightly. Um, it has it has acquired its own stature and status in its own way. I mean, it's it's looking kind of wobbly at the moment, though. I mean, the next tournament is due to be in Germany in twenty twenty four. But in the light, I mean, I was just reading before we we, we started speaking to tonight, Jonathan, that um, you know there's there's this kind of Nations Cup invitation that's been extended to South American sides as part of this endless battle between FIFA and UEFA for two yeah. yearly World Cups. Um, yeah, I, I think. It, go on, go on. No, no, it's just the, the the whole the whole of um, much of life. I think feels uncertain. I think that thing broke yesterday about. South American teams being brought into the Nations League. I think that's more a case of UEFA saying to FIFA, um, we're not going along with your two-year World Cup. And if you do push it, yeah. if you have a UEFA, if, if you have a World Cup without UEFA and CONMEBOL, it's not going to be a World Cup. Yeah. You can't do it without us, and we don't want to do it. I don't think I'll be very surprised if Brazil end up in the Nations in the UEFA Nations League. Uh, I think that's just gesture politics. I could be wrong. But uh, I think that was all about UEFA just reminding FIFA that without them, they don't have a World Cup. Yeah, it struck me as a chess counter move to an attack, so to speak, in a game of chess and um, big money ch uh, chess in this case, because the, the counterpoint to that is the amount of money that the world federations and, and the FAs can potentially gain from a two yearly World Cup. But it's it just seems the it's this endless desire in football to pump it up and you it's lose an absolute that nonsense. It's a complete nonsense. Like this guy Infantino, he he came in touting himself as the reformer, but if anyone who was even half familiar with his career over the years would know that, that was a load of bull from the start. Mm. Uh I was I was tweeting about it today. I, I I honestly think this guy is way, way worse than Blatter was. At the end of the day, Blatter was just basically a, a crook. A common thief who lined yeah. his own pocket. He he wasn't stupid enough or mad enough to try and destroy FIFA's own show. To kill the golden the golden goose yeah. almost. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's by far it's it's by far the biggest sporting event on earth. It, the world shuts down and watches it. 
that in a way that just isn't true of the Olympics anymore and hasn't been for yeah. a long time. Um, and this guy wants to just have it every, have it on all the time. And like, are you kidding me? I, who who let this hooligan in charge of the of the of the family jewels? You know what I mean? It's I, I do I do think that he. I, th- I think he's deranged in some way. I really do because there's no way. Um, it doesn't make sense from a business proposition. You're 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 just and you're throwing all the regional tournaments around around the world in the bin because you can't have the Euros if this thing is on. No. Um, it's it's very dispiriting to see it actually, and I hope that somehow he gets reined in at some point because he's got he's going to wreck the whole thing if he's if he's allowed to. I think. You want you kind of want Batman to descend from out of the sky and nick him for something, but um, <laughs> we, 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 we'll see. We'll see. Well, I, 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 I would stop short of calling for his assassination, but I think you know. Where I'm <laughs> I'd have to delete that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favourite moment, a favourite tournament, a favourite goal, or anything of that kind that you want to share with us before I let you go, Jonathan? Um, I was asked this on another podcast the other week, and uh, I went for. I, obviously, the, we all remember the big goals, like um, yeah. Like Van Basten against the Soviets in '88, and sharing him against the Dutch after at the end of that brilliant yeah, move yeah. by Gaza yeah. and McMahon yeah. or whoever it was. But um, there's one I always love, and it's 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 um it's not been it, it wasn't shown in Britain widely because it was '84, and the British media were down in South America following England on the uh, South American tour against Brazil and Uruguay, and um, it was scored by a guy called Frankie Verkauteren. Who played as a left wing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, very good player. Um, one of those really underrated players that Belgium seemed to churn out all the time in the eighties. And um, he scored against Denmark in a match that Belgium ultimately lost. It was a decider to see who got into the semi-finals in the group. And um, Belgium went two 0 up and blew a sitter at the start of the second half. And Denmark came back from that point and won three two. But Verkhoven's goal is amazing. Uh, he, I think he he collects a throw in out on the right, out, out on the left, sorry, near the corner flag, looks up and just absolutely blasts it from miles out at a very sharp angle over the Danish keeper, Ola Quist, and into the top corner. And uh, as I say, it, I think it got shown briefly in Britain on a on a late night ITV yeah. or BBC highlights package one evening, but it's it's there on YouTube in all its glory. Frankie Burkhauer, Denmark, nineteen eighty four. Uh, I urge everyone to have a look at it because it's a wonderful, wonderful role. That's a great choice. I like that choice. The name of the book, listeners, is Euro Summits. It's published um, via Pitch Publishing. You can get it on Amazon, I'm seeing here. And good old WH Smith and Walter Stones. That's the one that we favour. Hive.co.uk as well also feature it. It's by Jonathan O'Brien, Euro Summits, the story of the UEFA Football Championship. It looks a fantastic book. Well done for... Uh, producing it, Jonathan. I've really enjoyed that conversation, mate. Thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it, mate. No problem, Nick. Thank you.